For footy, Edgar, thanks for joining me. We'll get going with the pod in just a minute. Give everybody a chance to join in on the chat fun. Still recovering from that hockey game last night. That was pretty rough, man. It was a it was a barn burner. Yeah, why you got to do us like that? It's nothing like uh, doing a, a soccer podcast while you're paying attention to a hockey game. <laughs> yeah, um, it was funny because uh, afterwards uh, on Twitter, I was getting some messages from Kings fans, and they were like, "What the heck was that?" <laughs> like, that was fun. Um, some people were sending me DMs asking if Big Bird Baker is going to make a comeback in future shows. You got to tell me one of these days where you got that from. Uh, just alliteration. Sounds alliteration. cool. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, I mean, I came up with that script on the fly. So I was like, yeah, I got to think of something for him. I was like, this sounds cool. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. It was, it was fun to have a nickname if you have no idea what it means. That's the point of nicknames. <laughs> Like when I lived in Kansas, I came back and my fraternity brothers, they're like, what's the like out there? And I was like, well, let me tell you. And as soon as I said that, they're like, your nickname is Kansas. I'm like, but I didn't say anything. You're Kansas. I'm like, all right, fine. So it's stuck. So I'm Kansas. Hey, that works. Yeah. All right. So yeah, everybody, uh, welcome to Flyover on the, the live stream. We've got Edgar from News Across the Galaxy here. Uh, LA Galaxy greatness in our midst. I was on his show last night, so he's gonna he's gonna return the favor, kind of get us going here to, for some LA Galaxy St. Louis City preview tonight. We're gonna get going in the pod in a moment. Edgar, you ready to go? Yes, sir. Let's go. A little souvenir from Canada. Too good. All right. <clears throat> you ever been there, by the way? Canada, I've only been on the uh, back part of a cruise. Uh, Vancouver is gorgeous. Beautiful. beautiful haven't, been to, haven't been to Vancouver proper. I've been to Victoria. Okay. Not All bad. Right. Yeah. All right, here we go. Welcome, everyone, to Flyover Footy. My name is Matt Baker, joined by my friend in soccer, Edgar, from News Across the Galaxy. We've got a special Flyover Footy for you tonight. It's going to be a preview of St. Louis City, LA Galaxy. I'm the only Flyover Footy member you're going to be hearing from tonight, but... I've got a fun conversation lined up for you. Edgar, how you doing tonight? I'm doing okay, man. I'm still a little uh, little beat up from that hockey game last night. Uh, those uh, those Blues fans, man, they're pretty rough. Um, I mean, I was taking shots from the blue line, and they were just blocking them. I mean, you guys were on fire last night. But that's okay. It's another day. I love the fact um, that it was uh, it, it's the first of a doubleheader, kind of. The Kings and the Blues. Now we've got City yeah. Galaxy. You blues one in St. Louis, and now we get to go see how it's going to end up in LA. It's kind of nice that way. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, it's amazing. It's like the stars aligned. Uh, it was just the perfect time to do something on the fly. Um, like I was telling you before, uh, you know, we, were, you know, before we got on live, live, um, that I was thinking to myself, you know, let's let's spice it up a bit. This is an opportunity to do something different. So I was like, let's do a hockey theme, and man, that it worked. So that was. Thank you so much for playing along, man. Even with the funny nickname. Yeah, if you, if you get a chance, anybody who's listening to this on the podcast or if you're watching the live stream, go check out News Across the Galaxy on YouTube. Uh, I was a guest on Edgar's show on Wednesday night. We got to do a little soccer talk while we were watching and paying attention to the Blues, King, Blues Kings game. It's just a fun night, and now we're going to shift it into St. Louis gear. So, Edgar, hope you don't mind being along for the ride on some St. Louis City news to start things off. But uh, for better or for worse, we have a lot of news to talk about on the St. Louis side. And actually, it's fun that we're doing this uh, like a part two because a lot of the things that we talked about on your show, we've got some big updates to them. So let's... Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. This reminds me of the Nashville show because uh, I did a two-parter with the, the the fella from Nashville. His name is Tim mm -hmm. Sullivan. Uh, great guy. Um, and we he asked me to be on his show on Tuesday night and we talked about the match prior to the inner Miami match. Oh. And then afterwards, he came onto our show, and we had to talk about what a toll that took on them, and the fact that they lost Walk, I mean, Walker Zimmerman. I mean, that's a huge blow to them. And then I, I this morning, I heard the news from St. Louis, and I was like, "Oh, oh, that changes thing absolutely." I'm sure you know you guys are pretty upset about that. And if you haven't heard the news, Edgar's alluding to the fact that Edu Leuven, central midfielder engine that drives the St. Louis city offense is out for a minimum of two weeks with a hamstring injury. Bradley Carnell broke the news to everyone on Thursday's press conference saying, quote, he felt something early on in training yesterday, meaning Wednesday, 
We're going to look into it further, but I would give us a two-week window before he can resume training or review after two weeks to see where we are. He said, he followed up saying he's unsure if it's connected to anything previously. We know that Leuven was out for four weeks. He was given a four to six week timeline last year in 2023 for a quad injury. And he came back at the early part of that. So hopefully we get another good Leuven response to the medical treatment. We get some good responses to his hamstring this time, because as we saw on social media, so many comments, hamstrings can be tricky. This yes. can be something that lingers if it's not properly cared for, properly rested, and just properly healed in time. So buckle in for a little bit, St. Louis City fans, because as, as excited as we have been in the past couple of weeks with the New York City game, with the Austin game, seeing Leuven lead the team in touches, in key passes, in recoveries, in some crucial areas that drive the St. Louis City offense and connect our lines so well, we're going to have to see who can step in to replace that or what the St. Louis City offense looks like without Edu Leuven early in the season for at least a few weeks. Edgar, you were talking with me last night on your show about uh, you and Bryant, your partner, we're talking just so much about Leuven and what he, how impressive he has been. So given everything that we had talked about and what you had expected from Leuven, what, what, did you, what are your knee-jerk reactions coming from the other side knowing we're not going to have him? Well, the the first time I heard about the what happened to him, it, it was through the filter of some Galaxy fans who <laughs> reacted by saying, "Hey, this is awesome for us. You know, this <laughs> this is, you know, this is you know, good look, you know, good news for us." But uh, you know, me, uh, I've been around the sport long enough where I want to see the best. Right? I mm -hmm. want to see the you know, I want to see a good fair matchup because to me that that shows like we were talking about. We want to see a barometer of where both teams stand at this point in the season. It, it's an important test for both clubs. Mm -hmm. I want to see Galaxy go up against the best. So seeing this is was really uh, disappointing for me. It was uh, it was kind of sad to see a player of that caliber get hurt, especially somebody that important. And the fact that it was a hamstring injury. Um, I, when I was younger, I, I used to be a forward, and I, I remember like one time I got a hamstring injury, and uh, you know I was young. I was like 19, 20, and I didn't think too much about it. And I tried to come back in two weeks, and I really messed it up. And let me tell you, those hamstring injuries, they never go away. Like, I still – that same hamstring still bugs me from time to time. Uh, if I don't warm it up, if I don't stretch it out well enough, I'm sure that um, Leuven has, like, the best medical care available to him. But mm -hmm. it's just – it's one of those things, man. Nature, you can't, you can't beat it. Uh, hopefully, it's nothing that lingers for too long uh, because – if it does, then St. Louis might have to start thinking about ways to uh, replace, not replace them, but, you know, to figure out how they're going to fill those big shoes that, you know, that he, that, that great contribution that he brings to this club. Um, as far as what Galaxy is going to do, I'm sure Galaxy is going to find a way to exploit uh, the fact that he's not going to be there. But um, I don't know. Uh, it's still so early right now. Uh, I'm sure St. Louis is going to try to, move things around and make things difficult for the LA Galaxy. LA Galaxy um, is dealing with a few things themselves, nothing to that, to that extreme, but we're just hoping that uh, uh, to have a good game on, on Saturday. Edu Leuven's not the only player that was going to be missing for St. Louis city. It didn't really seem like we got any good news at all on our side from some of the players in, in the depth discussion who have been missing in action. Uh, defenders, Kyle Hebert and Josh Yarrow, along with, Defensive midfielder Jabulu Blome. Carnell said this week, head coach Bradley Carnell, they had a good week of training for all three of them, and they're going to evaluate them to see if they're ready to travel. Travel day for St. Louis is, of course, Friday, and so we'll see if they make the trip. But it, it didn't sound like there were positive updates akin to what had, he had been previously saying about guys like Rasmus Alm. So when Rasmus Alm was ready to go, Bradley Carnell was very upfront that that the, the recovery had been good, the trainings had been good, and he was a candidate for selection seemed a little more guarded when it comes to Hebert, Blome, and Yarrow. And for Jabulu Blome in particular, that offers some interesting questions about how St. Louis is going to be rolling out their midfield. And so we're going to get into some of those as we look at the projections, but just some early thoughts are, this could be an interesting look for guys like 
Tomas Ostrak, Jose Kojima, who may make the game day roster as some depth in that midfield position. Will Indiana Vasilev stay in the attacking midfield or will he be called upon to drop back a little bit, maybe in a number eight role, kind of like he was playing last year when we needed him in the, the double pivot with Leuven. There's a lot of questions up in the air for St. Louis in that regard. And it, it harkens back to last year in 2023 for this. So before we pivot into previewing and looking at the Galaxy's injuries in particular, I remember back, and I just want to refocus everybody to the Edu Leuven, Edu Leuvenless St. Louis City team last year. And it took about three games to figure things out without Leuven. This was the middle of the season. We had already lost Klaus. We had figured out how to win without Klaus. And then Leuven goes down for a few games. And it took some time. So... You're looking at a potential perfect storm scenario here if we're being as realistic as possible where we knew this was going to be a dogfight. We knew that these are two of the better teams early on in the season. And so you have to take this injury for what it is and put your realistic glasses on. I'm always a glass half full kind of guy, Edgar. So I'm, I'm the last person you would really expect to say, oh, this is this is looking bad, but I'm I'm being realistic and I am always optimistic in how Bradley Carnell can fight through adversity and figure out what needs to occur. I'm bullish on the St. Louis city depth with Thomas Ostrock. Jose Kojima has shown some good things so far early the season, knowing the St. Louis is going through this, what kind of injury concerns are the galaxy dealing with? And, uh, Bilbo Swaggins in our chat mentions, when does Jalen Neal get back? Um, I assume it's not going to be St. Louis, but Gabrielle Peck may be returning. Yeah, uh, as far as Jalen Neal is concerned, let me address that right away because um, Jalen Neal, it's a unique situation with him. Um, you know how some players grow up within your academy and they come up through the, the academy squad and they join the junior squad and then they join the senior squad? That's Jalen Neal for us. He's a he's a kid straight from one of our local communities. And his mom is very uh, visible, very vocal on the Twitter. Everybody absolutely adores her. They love her. Jalen Neal is a wonderful human being. He donates a lot of his time to the local community. And um, he's a lot of, you ask any Galaxy fans, you know, especially the supporters, you know, what they think of Jalen Neal, and they immediately they'll say he's one of us. And so everybody's been watching very closely um, what's been going on with Jalen Neal, because he's been out for a while. Uh, he started having injury issues last summer, right after the Gold Cup, where he had to, he didn't finish the tournament. He got hurt when he was with the US. And uh, that was really sad for me to see that uh, because I actually I was actually in Charlotte to watch the USA play against Trinidad and Tobago, and when they announced him, he got a nice little ovation from the crowd. Um, at the time, when he was playing at a very high caliber, I compared him to a very young Eddie Pope, and I was really hoping to see that kind of um, career path for him. You know, have that kind of uh, influence on the U.S. as far as our national team is concerned. Now, shifting to the LA Galaxy, a lot of people have been asking his mom on Twitter. <sighs> So, you know, when is he coming back? When is he, you know, and you don't ask those things, right? And right. she doesn't respond. And then some of us, you know, that we're, I don't know if we're gatekeeping, we're, you know, we're, we're very protective of her, Mama Neil, right? Sure. And so we're like, we're like, you know, you know, don't ask those things, you know, let it happen. You know, GL Jalen will come back when he comes back. But then we started hearing that he actually, uh, whatever injury he had with the, with the U.S., that was over with. And then we found out he had an abdominal hernia. And somebody that young to get an, you know, that kind of injury, it's, um, you know, it can be pretty serious. Mm -hmm. And so we heard about that and then time went by and uh, we asked for updates and still the same and it's still the same. And it's still, that's this cloud of uncertainty with Jalen Neal. We're not sure when he's going to come back. Everybody's trying not to, I guess, think about it too much because we're hoping for the best. But he's young enough where I'm sure he's gonna um, he's gonna make a full recovery. But when he does, it'll be a huge boon to this LA Galaxy squad. Um, we depend a lot on center backs that are that are have a lot of experience, but they're older, and you know older legs get tired, you know, over the course of a very long season. Mm -hmm. So having somebody like a Jalen Neal come in, who at his age shows a lot of calm, um, very you know calm demeanor. I was trying to say. You know, in that position, we've had center backs come in at, at his age, and they look completely lost, flustered uh, when facing against some of the stronger players in the, in MLS. Jalen is the complete opposite. He's very, very chill, very relaxed, doesn't seem flustered, and that's something that immediately you notice from him. And so, to not have that for somebody that we hope is a pillar of this team at least for the next few years, because 
to be honest, I don't see him being here for very long. This guy's going to end up somewhere in Europe at some point. But for now, we don't know. Uh, we just keep our fingers crossed that he comes back sooner than later. And uh, so sorry if you guys, you know, that are watching him on the on the U.S. radar. Yeah, he, he's not going to figure with the probably with, he's definitely not going to be with the U.S. in the Copa America squad. Uh, hopefully we get to see him later in the season. Uh, and uh, when he does, I'm sure that he's going to start getting calls to the U.S. again. No doubt about that. Absolutely exciting player. And I think uh, I think everybody's going to be excited, Galaxy fans or otherwise, to see him return just to see the promise that he has. Uh, last night on your show, we talked about we talked about Peck and how he would return. But you're 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 assuming or guessing, thinking that he probably won't start. He might come off the bench again. Is that a, an accurate assessment? Uh, that that might be the case. Uh, Greg Vanny shuffled a lot of lineups around last year. You know, you know how on your show you're saying like, "Oh my God, we got to see the same lineup for the first time in God knows how long." <laughs> well, Greg Vanny, I uh, mean, it might have been to due to all the injuries that Galaxy had last season, but he was uh, shuffling a lot of lineups, trying to figure out some way. <laughs> things Sorry, I'm a dog right here. <laughs> We, we're having a lot of heavy wind out here right now, and so it blows. Hey, we know about it. We, it's it's we had two or three tornado warnings in St. Louis today. Dear God, I don't miss those at all. <laughs> so my, my dog, I have a hound dog, and any little thing stirs her up. But um, <laughs> sorry about that, folks. <laughs> all but, good. Um, <laughs> uh, where, where was I? I got startled here. Um, uh, Peck returning. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Starting thank you, thank bench. You. Yeah, I think he's gonna, you know, he's gonna be on the bench. Obviously, he's coming off his wedding. Uh, I yep. mean, the guy deserves some kind of, even if it's like two or three days of uh, honeymoon or whatever, you know, whatever he did him and his wife. Um, we did see him back in training this morning. This morning he was back with the club, so uh -huh. he's he is gonna be on the roster, uh, whether or not whether he comes on earlier or later we're not sure i guess it depends on you know how much you know fun he had at his wedding <laughs> <laughs> but um i hope we get to see more of him because i feel like uh, he's somebody that like i think we mentioned that like, we're trying to be patient right trying mm -hmm. to wait for him to become acclimated to the club and learn the tactics and get up to speed with everybody and just let him go. Uh, and we're all looking for that moment because Joseph Pinto came in and he did that right away. He clicked right away. So with Gabriel Peck, we're just hoping that, you know, he eventually he will, we're going to see him on a more regular basis. But to be honest, uh, Diego Fagundes is doing such a great job uh, as a starter for the L Galaxy right now. Uh, it's going to be a battle for Peck. And uh, that's good for him. You want to you want to see him uh, tested. You want to see him challenged. So that way, when he finally comes on, you could say this this guy definitely earned that starting spot. And when he does come on, uh, and if he does come in in, in this game, uh, just pay close attention to him. This guy is a beast. He has. You always hear that term. He's got the dog in him. This guy yeah. has a motor inside of him. He uh, he's relentless. He will battle for every ball. When you get when you send the ball to him in space down the wing he will chase it down when he gets when he, and he immediately tries to turn towards the box he's the kind of guy that if a defender squares up against him he's not going to dive he's not going to fall over he will battle to get the ball into the 18 and try to either put it on frame or get it to somebody who's like sprinting in from the other side mm. so it's something to look out for this guy is he's fearless and you love to see that and a player that the, the club spent so much money on him 10.5 i think it was so for them to spend that much on a DP um, and then you get to see, you know, that kind of return. That's exciting. And I'm hoping to see that sooner or later, maybe in this game, that'd be fun, right? Yeah. I could think of other things that would be fun outside of that, <laughs> but let's frame this game coming into it. So we know that St. Louis city is one Oh and two with one win, two draws, five points, a plus two goal differential with five goals scored in their first three matches. Those first three matches include the draw at RSL at home, one-to-one, -one, a 2-0 win against New York City at home, and then drawing Austin away 2-2. Two -two. That, that's good for tied third in the West. Joining them tied for third is the LA Galaxy. Same record, five points, one win, two draws, plus two goal differential, but the Galaxy are just slightly ahead with six goals scored themselves. Their form in the last three games, they, you guys started off drawing Miami one-to-one -one in Miami's second game, your first, to start the season. You defeated the Earthquakes in the Cali Classico 3-1 at San Jose, and you drew Nashville in Nashville last week, which was 
a fun matchup to watch. It was, and the only home matchup that you guys have had so far was Miami. So this is a return of, of sorts to you at home, right? Yeah, I'm glad you had fun with that match because it was cardiac for me, man. <laughs> I was first of all, I was at a kid party, so that, that's pretty traumatic. And it was itself. great and TV. Then, and then I kept getting updates to my friends, and I was like, "Oh my god, we're down two nothing!" <laughs> and then they started uh, with the comeback, and then my friends would tell me like, "Oh my god, um, you missed it! You know, Pooch missed a penalty kick, and then uh, you know, uh, Yevlich. I'm sorry, um, Yovlich missed a penalty kick, yeah. and then later on he missed a sitter. And when I went back and saw the highlights later on, I was just like, "Oh dear God, all these missed opportunities," which. I'm sure all of us at some point, you know, especially this early in the season, are burying our heads in our hands saying, man, if only this would happen, right? And you told me that uh, St. Louis, you know, had some opportunities, golden opportunities to take out Austin, and they didn't. So you understand yeah. what I'm where I'm coming from. Preaching to the um, choir entirely on that. And and we talked, <laughs> this is one of the fun aspects of this, I think, is it's, it's not going to make any of the highlights or any of the overt preview discussions, but... The, the fact that the Galaxy have been so subpar at PKs so far this year. Oh, and Roman Berkey has historically, if there's one aspect to his game that you could say it's not top tier, it's his defense against PKs. So this could be a battle of just something has to give. Like we said, somebody <laughs> has to either, a, a, some, Berkey's going to show up or some a goal is going to be scored on a PK if that ends up happening. And with these two teams that are probably going to go for, pretty physical at it, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Oh, yeah. We, we were talking about Johnny Nelson's revenge game, right? Uh, and the, the Gordie Howe hat trick. <laughs> the storylines abound in this game. I, I, That's, you know, r- right off the bat, before we talk about how the Galaxy have looked in these three games and what some takeaways have been, uh, the, the Berkey and the Jovalich PK battle could be something fun to watch. <laughs> right off the bat, Johnny Nelson, AZ Jackson. Let's all remember a preseason when these two teams faced each other at Coachella. The double yellow card, uh, AZ, I think, I think he actually beat Nelson to assist uh, Nuki Thorson on a goal in preseason. This is the kind of battle that I hope we see in the second half. Now, I, we talked, and I don't think Johnny Nelson's expected to start necessarily, unless Greg Vanny really does want to make this a revenge game. But <laughs> but I think that would be a fun second half match, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, we were joking uh, last night about, because um, we were doing the whole hockey theme, right? And I was sure. like, you know, if you're familiar with hockey, you know what the Gordie Howe hat trick is, right? You get a goal and assist in a fight. So I was like, I would love to see Johnny Nelson come in and do something like that because it's tra- it's drama. We love yes. drama in our football. Not, you know, not crazy drama, but just the right amount of drama where you can you can go home and say, yeah, that was fun. We need our storylines. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of storylines. You know, like you said, there's the, you know, Berkey versus, you know, the 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 galaxy players that just can't put the ball in the net uh you know now i don't know who the heck's gonna line up is it gonna be pinto is it gonna be Facundes? maybe my yoshida our captain who knows maybe they might put mccarthy our goalkeeper up you know <laughs> have to take penalties um but yeah a lot of people uh now that you mentioned nelson just to let uh st louis fans know uh, a lot of people in LA are slowly beginning to notice uh, Johnny Nelson. Mm-hmm. At first, people there were a lot of question marks surrounding him. Uh, Matt, you were very gracious to come on to our show and explain, you know, uh, what Nelson's addition to the club was at the time. Uh, but the fans, you know, the the general population, you know, they weren't able to didn't have access to that. And but they they've been noticing him. They're noticing like he's a very serviceable, hardworking guy who comes in, and you don't feel there's going to be like a huge drop off as far as quality is concerned. Because he just does his job, and the fact that we have somebody like Pinto along that flank helps a lot because it takes some of some of the, I guess, some of the weight off his shoulders. So he he just focuses on just doing simple things, going up and down. But when he's called on to to move up, he will. And uh, but so far, nothing to complain about with John Nelson. So thank you very much. We really appreciate him. Glad we could help on that one. We had our our left back struggles that I think every St. Louis City fan listening to this is just <laughs> rolling their eyes at thinking about what we had to deal with last year and wishing for the the quick arrival of Nicholas Dewar into our starting lineup, but actually happy with how Anthony Marcanic has been doing. He has been no slouch at all and holding his own out there, uh, fresh off the Rapids too from last year. Edgar, let's let's look at some of the stats that frame this game too. Uh, we're a stats-based show. We love to dig into the the nitty gritty into how these teams stack up against each other. So through now three matches, which we're starting to see some trends develop, we've got the LA Galaxy averaging around fifty-one percent possession, St. Louis averaging around forty-five. But the games so far this season, that the averages might sound like, oh yeah, that sounds like an LA Galaxy team, or this sounds like a St. Louis team in the mid forties. 
but the the individual games have been so wildly different. I looked it up and LA Galaxy against Miami had 37% possession. Miami's the only team in the league that essentially possesses the ball more than the Galaxy regularly. And they crushed you guys in possession in that first game. But then you turned around and had 63% possession against the Earthquakes and then 53 against Nashville. So I feel like you're you're kind of settling in there. Same thing with St. Louis, especially when they're uh, at home, especially away, we're starting to see some interesting things happen where at home we had 37% possession against RSL, 43 against New York City. And then we figured out how to score goals by having possession against Austin. <laughs> so that was exciting to see. Both of these teams, high octane shots, shots on target. They're both averaging 15, 16 shots, both averaging five, six, seven shots on target. And they're, they're, being very effective in progressing the ball, both teams. Key passes, passes that lead directly into a shot. The Galaxy have 39 on the year. St. Louis has 31. Shot creating actions per 90. This is a stat that I love to give because it says the two offensive actions that lead to a shot, a pat, which are a shot, a pass, a take on, drawing a foul, those moves that get you into taking a shot. The Galaxy have 30 of these. St. Louis has 22. The Galaxy, though, are the fourth lowest team in MLS in tackles with only 34 tackles through three games. St. Louis has 46 interceptions, which is a key stat for any team playing St. Louis because St. Louis likes to send the ball and we don't make many short passes. Medium to long is our bread and butter. The galaxy are third highest in MLS in interceptions with 40 through three games. Progressive carries is another fun one that I like to look at where the galaxy, thanks to Ricky Pooge, 56 progressive carries throughout the first three games. And then overall touches. This is one that, you're going to start to see some separation as these games develop between these two teams. Overall touches, just showing the volume of possession, essentially. The Galaxy have already over 2,000 touches in three games. St. Louis has just under 1,500. So you're seeing probably what we're going to end up with is, I would say, two to 300 uh, difference in number of touches overall. But my highlight stat of this, as we go through all this, is passes received, and progressive passes, progressive passes received, which is a completed pass of greater than 10 yards from the furthest point in the last six passes or a pass into the penalty area. What it says is essentially if you're if you're progressing the ball around the field, this is that that one indicator on you moving the ball up the field significantly. So if you take the number of five or six passes before that and you have one that's longer than 10 yards, you take that as your progressive passes received. The LA Galaxy, through three games, have over 600 more passes received in general than St. Louis, but the number of progressive passes received is almost identical. So St. Louis, in moving the ball up the field greater than 10 yards, is about the same as the Galaxy. This, this really shows how the Galaxy moved the ball up the field. There are stats that go advanced that talk about uh, the number of passing sequences, but Edgar, does this sound like it describes the Galaxy team that you're familiar with watching where you have a lot of these short passes, you have a lot of passes per possession and the way that you progress the ball is very, very tight, very intentional, much less trying to spread the field out. Yes, definitely. A lot of the off, I mean, the offense pretty much runs through Ricky Pooch. And so that means getting the ball up to him up the middle, which is kind of interesting because in seasons past galaxy would try to work the wings more, but they're, I don't know what they're trying to exactly do with Ricky Push because for the longest time, one of the things that we were asking for was an a real cam, a real center attacking mid, and which Ricky is not, but they're trying to make him into something like that. So filtering the ball to him, and Ricky, Ricky wants to be the man. You know, he you know he he's out here you know in a, in L.A. which you know. Depending on how you look at it, you'd be like, it's Hollywood, right? Eh, Hollywood's like <laughs> off in the distance, but you know, it, it gets that kind of a feel, right? You're in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. So he he'll, he wants to be the man, right? He wants to be the man. So he will get the ball and he will carry it. And a lot of times, Galaxy fans are like, please, Ricky, your winger is waving at you. Pass the ball. <laughs> the guy is wide open, and Ricky would just be like, <laughs> hustling. And he'll have three defenders around him, or like, pick, pass, pass the ball, Ricky. And that's just, this is one of the reasons why Tyler Boyd was, you know, going nuts last year. Uh, he would mm. make these fantastic runs up the flanks, and Ricky would just you know, be trying to. He would he would see. We would joke. There'd be three defenders in front of him, right, with forks and knives out, you know, fo foaming at the mouth. 
<laughs> and then there's Tyler Boyd off on the side, like waving at Ricky. And then Ricky would be like, okay. And he just run into the three defenders <laughs> instead of passing the ball off. But uh, we're hoping to see less and less of that because he has these amazing tools at his disposal, right? With, uh, with mm-hmm. Joseph Pinto and with Gabriel Beck, who eventually is going to become uh, more of a consistent part of this offense. But we're seeing more of a trend towards him actually, look, you know, lifting his head up and start trying to find his teammates. And some of those goals, many of those goals that Galaxy scored were did come from the wings once the ball was distributed to the outside, especially in, in the last third, in the attacking third, where Joseph Pinto was able to use his speed and they were able to work with Diego Fagundes and Mark Delgado, to, who was two of our midfielders, and they were able to whip the ball back and across the box, causing some, some sort of chaos and get the ball into the back of the net. Uh, as far as Ricky's concerned, uh, I noticed that uh, St. Louis plays very aggressively. And one of the things that you can do to really throw Ricky off his game is to just get on him and, and push him around and even foul him a little because um, he ha- he he's still young. And so mm-hmm. he, he, uh, he has a, a certain temper. And if you're able to really get under his skin, it's gonna uh, it's gonna affect him. Now, in the game against Inter Miami, uh, you saw the possession was really high for Miami. I mean, they had some world class mm. players right on their roster. Ricky tried to be the man. He tried to carry the ball and do all these things, but the Miami players were having none of it. They're just pushing him and shoving him, and you know, and he would he would get some of his runs here and there. He would do a little thing to knock those gets to the ground, but. I guess that class of player, you can only do it for so much, right? And um, that's what we saw. Now, as far uh, against St. Louis, like I said, um, maybe they're maybe they're going to be looking for that. Maybe they're going to be looking, knowing that uh, St. Louis is going to be more aggressive, and then they're going to try and get more, you know, more fouls called, uh, especially with this ref, uh, this shoddy refereeing. You never yeah. know. Something that could be a foul might not be a foul, but who knows? Maybe one day when you got Judy Hopps, you know, calling the game and. <laughs> You know, like, look at this. You know, if there's like seven yellow cards before the half or something. Um, well, honestly, that that's one thing I think St. Louis <laughs> might have learned from last year is how do you handle Ricky Pooj? Because I remember the game in LA last year where Sam and Denneran had circles run around him, got frustrated, and drew a red card. I mean, he had I think it was a second yellow, but the what Ricky Pooj can do if he's on his game and you don't have that high level tackler or defender who can stop him or have a professional foul, you know, not a, not a, a foul that will draw a card. He can really cause a lot of problems. And that's one thing I think we're going to be having issues with without Eddie Leuven is that again, defender in the midfield, who's physical, he's smart with how he tackles. He doesn't draw many cards Leuven. And so what is St. Louis going to have in the middle of the field? We know Chris Durkin is likely going to be the center defensive mid who's, tasked with keeping Puj out of the box and keeping uh, keeping him from finding players like Fagundes or like Paintsill. And the effectiveness of Durkin, I, I think he might be one of the X factors of this game from a St. Louis City perspective just because of what he's going to be asked to do against Puj. Now, I don't want to see more red cards. I don't want to see <laughs> Puj running circles around our players again. So this midfield battle really is going to be some one, one of the key things to watch knowing that Eddie Lubin's not going to be there and knowing how exposed St. Louis was at times when they played LA last year. Yeah. And one of the things you also got to look out for is uh, you think you, you put a body on him, right? But you also got to try to compensate because he's so shifty, right? He, he might, oh, yeah. if you get, if you get too close to him, he might, he might shake you loose and he's gone. But if you give him just enough space, if you give him just a little bit of space, he will punish you. Uh, the goal he scored against Nashville uh, was from the top of the 18 and, He's done that from time to time where, you know, he play he like he plays hero ball. He'll take the he'll be like, "Okay guys, I'm taking my shot." And he'll fire from outside the 18 and more often than not it goes flying up into the stands, but uh, this time he he's able to get over it and keep the ball, you know, level to the ground and mm-hmm. yeah, he scored. That was that that was what they needed to get back into that game. And that's one of the threats about uh of Ricky Pooch that you never know. Because everybody pays uh, so much attention to what he can do, how he can distribute the ball. You forget that this guy can actually punish you from taking shots from outside the box. So you you you're thinking to yourself, okay, let's try and block his lane. So he you know to limit his opportunity to get the ball and distribute it. But if he sees that you give him like a foot or two, he will take the shot. Because and I don't know if Banny has given him a green light to do that. 
or mm. it's just him, you know, taking that and saying, for here it. I go, guys. I'm going for it. He will. He, he, he will not even think about it. He will take that shot. So keep an eye on that. You're listening to us on the Big 550 KTRS. My name is Matt Baker here for Flyover Footy, joined by Edgar from News Across the Galaxy, previewing the LA Galaxy matchup. And Edgar, one of my favorite articles or favorite publications is Backheeled. And they had an interesting comment about the Galaxy uh, coming out of the Nashville game, saying the Galaxy are committed to playing with the ball and having an elite playmaker, like you mentioned, such as Pooj, who ties the whole team together. But they consistently leave themselves open to the counter. Nashville snuck in behind the back line from the opening whistle. When Greg Vanny's fullbacks bomb forward, they leave the center backs exposed. And in this article, they noted the age of your center backs. And you touched on yeah. this on your podcast, 35 and 36 opposing transition attackers are your enemy. What do you make of that? It's something that we know over here. We live by the sword. <laughs> we die by the sword. These guys, I mean, they're both World Cup veterans. You're talking about Maya Shida, uh, our captain, who was the captain for the Japanese national team in various World Cups. Uh, Martin Cáceres, who represented Uruguay at five World Cups, from what I understand. Oh. So, yeah, he's been around. He, he has a lot of experience. And the thing about experience is that, you know, you get experience from, you know, being old. <laughs> And uh, they have a lot of miles on their legs. So, and we know that here in LA land, we're like, damn, um, how long can we keep these guys out there? They give you a lot of experience. Calm down, Luna. She's upset. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to talk about those guys like that. I'm she, sorry. she doesn't like the age of your center backs. Yeah, she doesn't. But um, they, um, as, as long as they can stay on the field, as long as they can stay healthy, we're, we're okay. But we know that the moment the Galaxy faces off against a team that's speedy, that, that can counter a quick, there's going to be some trouble. This is why we're constantly hoping that Jalen Neal is mm -hmm. able to come back at some point. And uh, there's also the hope that at some point, Galaxy can pick up a serviceable, younger center back, hopefully during the summer, uh, that can come in and provide some relief because, uh, I mean, these guys are not long-term solutions. These guys are just yeah. there, you know, providing experience. Uh, hopefully, the the I mean the the hope was that Jalen Neal would be learning from these guys, you know, and a game in game out basis. Because one of the things that Galaxy would do would they would pair Neal with either Casares or Yoshida in the back before uh, Yoshida came in. It was Casares, so you had that good dynamic where Neal is quicker, and yeah, you know, I mean he's not super fast, but he's quick enough where he can get mm -hmm. back and cover for Casares. But now that he's not available. You know, it's 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 kind of hard to make that up. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a concern. It's definitely something that I'm sure other teams are going to exploit. Uh, we didn't see that too much in the Inter Miami match. Uh, we didn't see that too much in the San Jose because San Jose, uh, from the get go, Galaxy had them on their heels. And but against Nashville, yeah, you know, it started to happen. And uh, hopefully St. Louis isn't paying too much attention because <laughs> we want to see our guys, you know, undress like that on the field. So Edgar, this matchup features a lot of league leaders already. First three games. So a lot of the guys we've talked about on your side, at least uh, goals. Dejan Jovalich has three tied for first in the league. Mark Delgado has two assists tied for second. Ricky Pooj leads in just about every other non shooting category. Uh, number of free kicks. He's first in the league with 24 shots on target. He has nine tied for first. He has 304 passes attempted just himself. St. Louis, on the other hand, and this is driving a lot of the things I'm seeing in our chat. A lot of questions about our formation, a lot of questions about who we're going to have in potentially our playmaking roles, because our league leaders are Edu Leuven. Shots assisted. He's third with 12. He has 12 key passes through three games, third in the league, and 17 free kicks taken, second in the league. So he has a lot of things that need replacing. And my notes are essentially shot on this game because I had key players. I had Leuven in line to be the, the difference maker in this, the one who makes all the, the, the capabilities in our midfield work, the flow, and it's all shot now. So the question pivots on the St. Louis side to... How do we mitigate for that? And as we talk and, and wind down this show, looking at what formation St. Louis might run out here, how we're going to how we're going to cover for the loss of Leuven. I mentioned at the beginning that Thomas Ostrak comes to mind as the person 
just inherently to take over because I don't see this as you want to blow up the system. You you don't want to change the formation. Bradley Carnell is very much a next man up kind of guy. And so let's not, I, I caution against thinking about this too deep and trying to overthink what St. Louis might do to compensate for the loss of Edu Leuven. Um, we, we still have high level fullbacks that have been playing this game. Mark has been great. Doers on the horizon. Thomas Totland is a massive difference maker, and I would watch out for that guy. If you're watching this from LA, watch out for number 14, Thomas Totlin, our right back, because he will be in the attacking third more often than not, and he will be one of the biggest facilitators for our attack. He is that high caliber of a player and one of, if not our biggest addition in the offseason. Chris Durkin's also going to be right there, and like I said earlier, he's going to be tasked with taking care and eliminating Pooj, so we'll see how effective he can be. His Probably biggest real test, first real test right now since he didn't go up against Sebastian Driussi. Jabulu Blom, uh, Brendan Stanfield asked in our chat on our live stream, is Blom back? And the answer is probably not. Bradley Carnell was not very forthcoming in optimism for Jabulu Blom or Josh R. or Kyle Hebert. So I'm, I'm not expecting Blom back, but if we see him, that's going to be a happy um, a happy turn of events. I, I'm not being optimistic in seeing him. Our attack, though, there's a lot of questions in... The four four two or the four two three one because Klaus and Sam have started once together. It wasn't earth shattering. Both of them have had successes as subs, and both of them have had successes as starters. Not consistently though. So it is anybody's guess as to how we're going to be running those out. We haven't yet found a flow in our attack. In in Austin, for instance, Edgar, all of our attacker, our, our attacking offense, um, shots on goal, targets, touches progressive carries, things like that, went through our wide attacking mids. Celio Pompeu, Indiana Vasilev, even Thomas Ostrock when he entered the game, AZ Jackson, and Rasmus Alm, who made a cameo appearance for his first appearance in this in the season 2024 against Austin, played for four minutes or so, and he already had five or six, key, five or six passes, five or six touches on the ball where he was a key difference maker in helping us to create that second goal. Him and Klaus helped keep the ball, the facilitated the cross in from Totland Asalio that tied the game. I would look for more playing time for Rasmus Alm, but I don't know if he's there to start. So all this to say on the St. Louis side is I don't think we're going to be changing too much to compensate for the loss of Leuven because we haven't gotten into enough of a groove that I think we just say he's that vital to this 2024 team that if he if we lose him, we have to do something markedly different. Edgar, on your side... You're looking at a Galaxy team that for the past two games, they haven't changed their lineup at all. And I, I think we're expecting them to stay the same. What's your prediction on the formation and how this Galaxy team is really going to be playing against St. Louis? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, it's been uh, three games, the same lineup. For all three. three. Games, so, yeah, so if it ain't broke, why fix it? Uh, unless uh, Benny surprises us with Johnny Nelson from the start and Gabriel <laughs> Beck. I mean, that'd be... Fascinating. Galaxy fans would probably be wondering what the heck's going on. But for right now, um, <clears throat> the, it, it'll probably be the same starting lineup. It's like, a, it's like a, yeah, it's 4 3 3, pretty much, uh, mm -hmm. Vanny Ball. So we have uh, McCarthy at the back. Uh, John McCarthy he came over from LAFC. So a lot of Galaxy fans are still getting used to him. You know, he's like, it's not like he. It's not like he went up to, to his mother team for some detox and then came over here. No, he gets <laughs> straight from. Like from down right down the freeway, you know, fans are giving stadium. him the side eye a little bit here still. Yeah, people are like, yeah, I'm not gonna believe it until I see him, you know, in a, in a, in a kit and starting, you know, in a in, in a regular season. And he's come in and he's 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 a good goalkeeper. He's not he's not great. He's just, he's good. He's good and more mobile than Jonathan Bond ever was, which is kind of sad yeah. to say because we like Bond so much. He's a wonderful human being, but you know, being a nice guy doesn't you know doesn't, doesn't win games, right? But uh, at the back, like I said, we have our wingbacks, which are Julian Aude. He came from uh, Lanús in uh, the Argentinian uh, league. And um, he's a kid that uh, was highly touted by his fans over there. Uh, when, he, when he finally did uh, come over here in the summer, um, I know a lot of Lanús fans were very attentive to how he was going to react because he had just suffered the death of his grandfather. Oof. And so they're saying it affected him uh, greatly. And... His first few games here were pretty good, but then after that, you could tell there was a dip in quality. And I think uh, he, he was either homesick or you know he was still dealing with the grief of losing a you know a beloved family member. But he's he's a tall kid. He's fast. Um, my only gripe with him is that he's 
he hits the ground very easily. So you you run by him, he's like, ah, he knows like he got sniped or something. So <laughs> we're always wondering, is he dead? You know, and, oh, he's just you know doing his thing. You know, it's just the kind of football that he grew up playing, right? Uh, but that's Julian Alde. He's on he's on the left. On the right, we have Miki Yamane, who comes from the a Japanese national team. He has uh, we benefit from him because he has the experience of having played with uh, Maya Yoshida on the national team level for many years. Um, Yamane is younger. He's pretty quick. We're learning. Uh, he's, he's, he came in as an unknown, so a lot of people didn't know what to expect from him. So in these first three games, we're seeing this guy works really hard. He's very quick. Uh, he be- he makes very few mistakes, and he does his best to try to help uh, Yoshida when Yoshida's uh, speed uh, isn't there to you know get him back on time. So we've seen uh, situations where Maya Yoshida will make a mental mistake that we think will be a goal. And here comes Yamane out of nowhere to try and clean up for him. And that's been a very fresh insight for us because we, for a while, we got used to seeing Galaxy give so many trash goals where they make mental mistakes and they just don't have the speed to get back and clean up and they, they leave Bond out in his own. That's not the case this year. Um, and then at the centers, we have Captain Maya Yoshida and Martin Cáceres, who I spoke to about to you guys about earlier. In the midfield, uh, Mark Delgado, who is having a pretty solid season. Uh, Edwin Cerrillo is a player that I have not mentioned. We did not mention in our show. Edwin Cerrillo is a really young kid. He um, he came in uh, for the Galaxy, and he surprised everyone with his uh, performance against uh, a certain player named Lionel Messi. <laughs> he stood up to him. He didn't back down. Only 23 years old. He's a guy who was oh. in our academy. And so, I mean, I'm sorry, not our academy. He was in the FC Dallas Academy. We got him here last summer. And if, if you know anything about FC Dallas and their academy, they oh, yeah, quality players out. So when he came over, people were like, wow, this guy came from the FCD Academy. Let's see what he's got to offer. There wasn't too much, uh, too many opportunities for him last year. But this year, he's taken, he's been a starter every, in every game. And at first, people were wondering why. And then after three matches, they're like, yeah, this guy definitely belongs there. He's, he's, Really good, and uh, then of course Ricky Pouge, the man you know who who care he's like the spine of the offense, and then up top you have Dejan Jovilich at, at center forward, and then out in the wings you have Joseph Paintsill and Diego Fagundes. Paintsill, uh, he didn't look his best against Nashville. Uh, we talked about this, uh, Matt, about whether or not the time change had affected him having to wake up real early, you know, on this mm. real big boy trip in MLS, uh, having to travel, you know, way outside of California. Cause every match for him had been in California so far. Um, uh, so like you said, waking up, what, like 10 30 AM, nine 30 for us oh, yeah. go playing at that time. It, you know, it, it, he's probably wasn't ready for that, but watch this guy. If he comes to the game with a chip on his shoulder, He's going to be a menace because there was a locker room video of the Galaxy players in the halftime game um, of the San Jose game. And um, Greg Vanny was talking about, you know, let's go ahead and kill these guys. And which is kind of funny. Right? Like, you know, let's go out and effing kill these guys. Let's finish this game. And then after the game, uh, there was comments from Joseph Pinto say that if they keep playing this way, they're going to kill a lot of clubs. So, whoa, locker room material right there so he's got he's got that that vicious side to him so he's got that dog in him oh yeah so we got two wingers with that dog in him <laughs> so, <laughs> and a lot of barking out there rawr, rawr, rawr. Uh, i think that's one of, that's gonna be a battle for me to watch too so there's a lot of individual battles throughout the area yeah. we've got you know Pooj and durkin i think uh Paintsill, see how he's going to come against Anthony Marcanic or Nicholas Dewar, depending on who starts. There's a lot of a lot of really interesting things. Will Jovalich be able to get in behind Joachim Nilsson? Um, how will Thomas Totlin be able to go on our right side, your left? I'm excited to see the individual matchups. So that's your lineup. You feel pretty confident because that's how the Galaxy have been running it out the past three games. Mine, I'm going to stay mostly with the same mindset of St. Louis these past couple of games. I think we stick with a 4-2-3-1. Uh, I like Bradley Carnell did call out in the Thursday press conference, Klaus and Sam's ability to both start well, both sub well. They've had some conversations with both of them and their roles. It seems like he's being very mindful, intentional with handling this, this relationship and what it means for those two, because the downstream impacts of those two playing together means we're losing an attacking midfielder. You're talking one of, at this point, Celio Pompeu, AZ Jackson, Indiana Vasilev, or Rasmus Alm. Those are our, I think, top 
for attacking midfielders. And so if we're looking at only two of those players on the field, that's missing a lot. Individually, each one of them offers a whole lot of different things. So there's a lot to go that goes into starting both Sam and Klaus. And then in the second half, Bradley Carnell typically subs almost all of his attackers at some point. So you're losing them for a portion of the game and not able to replace like for like Sam or Klaus. All that said, I'm going with a little bit of, um, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a step, a, le- a little bit of a leap. Okay. In my starting lineup, I'm going to say it's a four, two, three, one running out Berkey and net, obviously. And I'm going to stay, I'm going to say Nicholas Dewar finally gets a start. It has to happen at some point. I don't know a way, but I don't think that left back position is going to be something that you progress like an attacker. You're not, I don't know if we're going to see Nicholas Dewar come on for 30 minutes and then 60 minutes and then nine. I think it's, he's going to have a point where he just starts and he goes until he can't go. And I think it might be this game. So Nicholas Dewart left back, Joachim Nilsson, Tim Parker, and then Thomas Totland round out the back line. Chris Durkin and Thomas Totland in the midfield. Celio Pompeu, AZ Jackson, Indiana Vasilev, and I'm going to go with Klaus to start this game up top. I don't think Rasmus Alm is there yet to start, which is an attacking midfielder question. And my biggest concern with this lineup is the spacing in our midfield in the attack. The one time we saw consistent runouts of uh, Thomas Totlin, I'm sorry, Thomas Ostrock and AZ Jackson, they they collapsed the space around each other. And there was difficulty in that attacking third for them to find space to work with. So that's the one concern I have with Thomas Totlin in the midfield, or Thomas Ostrock, man, too many Thomases in, in the midfield position. So Ostrock in the mid. Score prediction, Edgar, we got to get out of here for our KTRS portion. So what do you got for the score prediction? Uh, I'm going to stick with what I said last night. I uh, expect Galaxy to come out and uh, establish some kind of offense early on. So it'll be two to one LA Galaxy. I know, I know. I don't, I don't want to sound like a homer. I'm usually pretty unbiased. but Hey, of all people, you're preaching to the choir on the homer category here. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I call it like it is, you know, and I feel like Galaxy is going to get one at, at home, uh, two to one. Um, what's your prediction, Matt? I said 1-1 one, one on your show. I'm going to go 2-2 two, two, just because I think St. Louis is going to be a little more aggressive. I think they're going to try and and, and make up for the loss of Leuven's defensive capabilities. I, my question is how where the offense is going to come from without Leuven being the one to control the ball through the field. So that's the thing to watch is uh, whether it's Thomas Ostrock or Tom, Thomas Totland. How are these guys going to progress the ball? Who's going to be that engine? And is it going to be through the wings primarily or... We're going to let Salio carry the ball for days. So 2-2 two, two as I go. Edgar, any parting thoughts before we get out of here on this first portion? Yeah, uh, one of the things to look out for is also Dejan Jovalich. I mean, not just because he's been scoring goals, but his mental headspace. We talked about that last night where he's scoring goals, but he's not the same person he was in 2022. I feel like he still has some issues with his confidence. So mm-hmm. if his offense is shook, if it's, something happens to him early in, in the game, it might affect his performance later on. So keep uh, keep a lookout for that. Awesome. Great stuff as always, Edgar. It's always a blast talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for listening to us. We're Flyover Footy on the Big 550 KTRS, leading you into the match on Saturday night. As always, if you're not subscribed to our podcast, please do just search Flyover Footy wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to have a little bit of a wind down. Edgar's got to fly, but I'm going to solo run some MLS news. So if you're listening to us on the Big 550, download the podcast for some of that. If you're in the chat on our live stream, stay tuned because this could get interesting. Thank you as always for tuning into Flyover Footy and Go City. All right, and we leave the live stream running because we just we just fly by the seat of our pants here, Edgar. So thanks for joining us, man. I know you got to fly, and I appreciate the back to back nights chatting with you. Hey, likewise, man. You take care of yourself, and uh, let's hope for a good game. Thanks to everybody too. Uh, somebody said shout out to Galaxy and St. Louis FC legend Brian Gall. Thank you so much. Hey. We love them. He was an important part of our 2012 MLS Cup. And we really appreciate them. Okay, so good night, y'all. Awesome, dude. Thanks, Edgar. We'll talk to you later. All right, like I said, this could get interesting with a a solo run, some MLS news. So if you're in the chat, uh, gear up, because I'll be right back, as we usually do with the wind down, grab a drink, just lay back, chill out for a minute, and we'll get going with some of that news.
There we go. I just got to mess with the background. Never had a single frame here before, so this could be interesting. All right. There is some wild news going on in MLS. I don't know how everything just started exploding in the past couple of weeks, but I feel like it's a good analogy for my life this week. Just kind of, Things are kind of exploding and, and being kind of breakneck pace. So let's do this. Let's let's get to, into the single, single man version of a wind down. Welcome back to the wind down. As I mentioned at the end of our first portion, it's just me. So if you don't like the sound of my voice, you may be in for a rough time on this one. But if you do and you don't mind it, and you're into some uh, MLS musings, stay tuned. I've got a nice uh, citywide hoppy ale, hoppy pale in front of me, actually, which actually kind of is, is funny because of how many breweries have really adopted the NA beer. I think every single major brewery in St. Louis now has at least one flagship NA, and the citywide brand from Forehands is uh, no slouch. Very, very impressive. So the first thing that I think I want to get into is why well, if Phil had or Stu or Santi had been able to join, I probably would have gone into a little bit of an MLS touch base because there's some interesting interesting things happening in the MLS season. Things like Montreal, Toronto in the East being in first, tied for first place. Uh, you're having Minnesota rise from the ashes with their new head coach in first place. Uh, Vancouver, Colorado's out there. So there's some fun things happening in the first portion of the season. This weekend, though, if you are not used to tuning into MLS season pass, uh, shameless plug that all of their games are free. And so if you're not used to watching MLS matches, if you don't subscribe to it, um, or you've just been watching City maybe at a watch party, feel free to tune in throughout the week because the presentation's legit. The, the quality of the matches is fun to watch. And it, free weekends are always fun. The St. Louis City news that broke this week is their League's Cup announcement. And I will I will be very honest that I join the meh crowd. I'm not, I'm not hyped at all about League's Cup because of the taste in our mouths from the U.S. Open Cup. Um, fully supportive of the supporters group's decisions to boycott the League's Cup tournament. I think MLS has shot themselves in the foot on what could otherwise be an incredibly exciting tournament. I've said before, I'm a huge fan of the concept of League's Cup. I think it has a lot of potential, and there is a lot of ways in which you can marry having a League's Cup with U.S. Open Cup, with Champions Cup, and an MLS season, and none of it has to do with backing out of the one that is the most historic of them all. And so with that said, St. Louis League's Cup 2024 action starts July 27th against FC Dallas at City Park and will continue on August 4th against FC Juarez at City Park. The group stage will be those two matches for St. Louis City. And from there on, we see if they can progress and continue to play in this month-long gap of the MLS season. Important dates coming up to pay attention to if you are interested in League's Cup. On March 18th, which is next Monday, the right of first refusal for season ticket members. If you want to watch uh, some fireworks on social media, probably want to tune in to see what everybody has to say about who's giving up their right of first refusal. If you like some Facebook fireworks in those fan groups, that should be a, a nice show as well. On March 28th, the group and tournament strip pre-sales for MyCity Plus members. So if you're not a season ticket holder, March 28th for MyCity Plus members is a good date to look out for. April 15th, single match tickets for both matches played at City Park member pre-sale. And then April 17th, single match tickets go on sale for both of those matches against FC Dallas and FC Juarez. MLS has hyped up what their League's Cup schedule looks like, but not really going to cover that because we are not anticipating on covering a lot of League's Cup itself for those obvious reasons. Those two things out of the way, The Athletic had an interesting week for, and, and this is going to get into some roster rules. So I see there's a question from um, Cordis AJ in, in our live stream chat. Roster rules is one of the things. The Athletic had a, a few articles this week, and I know that, I know the athletic loves to get a lot of the exclusives. They're a, a good source of information, but there have been some comments this week that the athletics articles border on border on being a mouthpiece for the league. And I do see that a little bit in the three articles I'm going to allude to. Uh, one is the roster rule changes. One is the Don Garber and Nelson Rodriguez comments, executives for MLS comments on the U S open cup. And the other is, Don Garber's comments on the referee situation. 
I don't feel there was too there were too many pushbacks. Is the thing I th- I agree with that fact that there were things said, especially in the U.S. Open Cup article, that everybody is taking umbrage to, and I do mean everybody. I have not seen a single independent publication that has yet to say I see what they were saying or this makes sense. We understand what you're going for here. It is, and and I'll go through this this article in particular because it's universally panned. But let's start off with the roster rules. So let let me frame it with the question we have in chat. I do love roster rules. I love this topic. I wish MLS was more open with their roster rules and they were they were more flexible, but I love knowing the nuances that go into this. So Dirk and his U22 guy, do we know if any of our other guys would fit? Seems like the U22 DP change in the summer is something that Lutz, Hackworth, Bradley Carnell could leverage. I absolutely think they can leverage it. Unfortunately, none of our current players would fit because the U22 initiative only works for your first MLS contract. You can sign a player from outside the league who meets the age requirements to a U22 initiative contract, which means you can have a high dollar transfer fee. You can pay them more than the league maximum, but they only hit the budget at that $150,000, $200,000 range, and the transfer fee doesn't apply to the salary cap. That only applies to players on their first MLS contract. Chris Durkin is a U22 player because he was brought in, brought back to MLS, signing his first actual MLS contract as a U22 eligible player. And so he now is, I believe, 24 years old, but you can be a U22 up until your age 25 season. The impacts to the salary cap get a little less meaningful. So it goes from about 150,000, I think, to 200,000 in uh, how much it hits the cap. But Dirk Durkin applies because we got his U22 rights from DC United. We don't have anybody currently on our roster who would be able to like retroactively go. Doesn't quite work that way. But the whole change to this roster rule is previously, correct, homegrown deals do not count as that first deal. Currently with the roster rules, you have DPs and you have U22s that are coupled together. You have three DPs able to be signed to a single team. But if you sign all three DPs as senior level, meaning over the age of 23, then you only have one U22 initiative slot available. It limits the overall amount of discretionary spending you can have on on more players. If you have two DPs only, you have all three U22 slots available. If you have two DPs and a young DP, you also have all three U22 slots available. This move looks to decouple those, saying you can have three senior DPs, and now you can also have three U22s. I would very much think of this as the Inter-Miami rule post-Messi because of what they've been trying to do so intentionally, building their squad around as many of these high-dollar players as possible. They're the first team that I know of to have signed three U22s, one gets hurt, and then you bring in a replacement U22 on an $8 million transfer fee. That's the kind of money we're dealing with with Inter-Miami. I think Jorge Mas is finally getting his way to this actual meaningful change, but I don't know how many teams are going to take advantage of it. Currently, there are are only a handful of teams who even have three three, uh, DP slots taken that allows for just one U22. It's Nashville, it's New England, it's Orlando City, and FC Cincinnati. No other team really has the allotment of DPs that limits them. So we'll see how this makes for long-term on the roster rules. Uh, The next bit of MLS news is the one that's going to take a little bit of time to go over. I, I, I can't help but cringe at this. Looking at Don Garber and Nelson Rodriguez... Don Garber, obviously the commissioner. Nelson Rodriguez is MLS executive vice president of sporting product and competition. He's a Chicago fire vet. He's essentially Don Garber's right-hand man when it comes to all of this sporting competition related um, initiatives. And they had the, there there are so many quotes in here that I'm going to kind of try to break this down because it's, it's bothering me so much. One Don Garber quote in particular says, and this is related to the U.S. Open Cup, imagine MLB or the NFL playing all of their teams in a tournament that was scheduled during their season, in the middle of their season, in ways that the league had little to no involvement in at all. We financially have no involvement in it. We don't control the brand. We don't control the state of the facilities. This quote in particular is a microcosm of it all for me because that single mention, we don't control the brand, is, is if, it, if it doesn't directly benefit us, as a, as a league, as an entity, MLS, we don't want to be a part of it. If we can't control the revenue, if we can't control how it's being marketed, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Part of it is they did control the brand as MLS has a marketing arm called Soccer United Marketing, some that did have the rights to US soccer marketing for 
I, I think upwards of 20 years. They just, they, they were, they disassociated from U.S. soccer just a couple of years ago. And so now you're seeing more overt pushes since MLS doesn't have as much of a stake in this game. The state of the facilities is another one of those comments that has been used just like schedule congestion, which really has no true meaning in either the larger soccer landscape conversation where you see FA Cup, you have DFB competitions in Germany where they play in facilities because that's how you do it. That's what your domestic cup competition is. It's part of the beauty of it. You don't need to have state-of-the-art facilities for amateur and low division teams. That's not what the purpose is. And also, I would I would tend to say you're looking, uh, the pot is calling the kettle black a little bit in this conversation because of some of the facilities that MLS, even today, still has in regards to some of their turf fields and some of their just overall NFL stadiums that let's put Yankee Stadium aside for a second, barely qualify as state-of-the-art facilities. So there's a lot of talking out of both sides of his mouth coming from Don Garber in this one. As you go into the quote, they start to comment on how fans feel about the U.S. Open Cup. And we start to get into some funny math here, some funny, funny numbers thrown around where Garber and Rodriguez are citing MLS surveys conducted through their fan panel, which supposedly consist of thousands of fans that they converse with regularly saying that of these competitions, the open cup is third at an interest of 6% of interest for fans. Leagues cup is at 4%. Then the number one and two is MLS cup and CONCACAF champions cup. And they obviously position this as leagues cup being so new, it's only going to grow. It's already about to surpass the U S open cup. There's a lot of, it seems intentionally framing things to diminish the open cup because those other properties, aside from CONCACAF Champions Cup, which is just the absolute pinnacle of soccer in our region, they control all of those. So there's some obvious things going on here. Looking at some of the other comments, they do say, talking about the fans, they kind of belittle a lot of the fans who are passionate about the Open Cup. Nelson Rodriguez says, to us, it all ties back in together, but we're not just creating things. We're trying to listen to our fans. Quote, there is a very small, passionate group of fans who believe deeply in the Open Cup. He goes on to talk about his service with US, with the Chicago Fire and their success in the Open Cup. When we talk about the level of appreciation for the fans, Don Garber as well kind of said that th- this is a, a group of fans who are, you know, loud, small, and we think that they don't, are, they're not reflective of a lot of the other fan bases, a lot of the other fans in soccer in, in, in the, in the United States. So there's a lot of things going on here that they're trying to brush aside. They're trying to make it sound like they're doing what is best for soccer in America. And they're not responsible for anything else. They don't have an obligation to anything else, which is another huge part of the problem that the realization that you are a league inside of the U S soccer pyramid doesn't seem to be anything they're wanting to acknowledge. So this, this in in and of itself, the final quote here from Don Garber, it speaks for itself. I'm not going to go too far into it. U.S. soccer has new elected leadership. Their new management with JT Batson and his staff are doing a great job, but professional soccer has not been their focus, and nor should it be. It's not the focus of the English FA. It's not the focus of the German Federation. They've got a broader focus on what is it, what it is that they need to think about holistically, but the Federation has never really been in position to fund and prioritize the U.S. Open Cup. Two things with that. Obviously, the English FA and the German DFB do prioritize professional soccer. That's asinine to to suggest otherwise. But saying that the Federation has never really been in position to fund and prioritize the U.S. Open Cup looks at what you have done in particular as Don Garber and as MLS being in charge of the marketing and the a lot of the visibility of the U.S. Open Cup with Soccer United Marketing. They don't want people to really think about the what their position was before when they had a stake in the game because they didn't do anything to further what they're now criticizing. There's a lot, a lot more that goes into this, but um, I think that's enough for now. The last thing, as Don Garber continues to be in this news, because The Athletic had this roundtable conversation this week with Garber and with Nelson Rodriguez over at MLS offices, I think in New York. So they, there's a lot of different conversations that they had. This is the one I think that they actually pushed back a little bit at the athletic did. And Don Garber very much in the camp of pro 
the referee strike is still ongoing. The PSRA is the referee's union. They are locked out because they couldn't come to a labor agreement. And MLS, Don Garber, is very much on pro's side, the professional referee organization, the MLS-funded body which administers professional officiating in North America. On Tuesday, Garber talked about this strike, talk, or talked about the lockout, rather, because that's what it is. It's a lockout, saying, we're prepared to manage through this labor dispute with pro any way that's necessary to ensure that we are coming out of this in a way that is rational. Garber goes on to say, pro is going to continue to sit down and negotiate with the PSRA to hopefully reach a resolution, but if there's no resolution to be reached, we are more than prepared to see this all the way through. What does all the way through look like? What does that mean? Well, I think it means what we've seen the past three weeks magnified throughout the rest of the season. And as things progress, as things continue to escalate in concerns that players and fans have, because we've heard today on Thursday as I'm recording this from both the Independent Supporters Council, which represents the supporter groups of MLS and a lot of other leagues, as well as the MLSPA, who vehemently disagree with the notion that Don Garber had said in this article about fans thinking there's no real issue with this. And Don Garber said, quote, we do fan research on a regular basis. We have a fan panel of tens of thousands of people that we speak to regularly. There is no consumer blowback that the issues that we are hoping to have resolved with pro, our labor dispute, is having on any impact on our league whatsoever. He says, I read your columns talking about the athletic. I read other media reports. This view that it is having a negative impact on the league. Not only do we not see that through the research we do, but we've got to look at where we are. The replacement officials are, not by our standards, but by the standards of standards of pro up to a pro standard. There's a lot you can disagree with on that. First off with the notion that the fans are saying there's no issue. That's where ISC jumped in and said this is vehemently wrong. MLSPA jumped on that as well, saying that we we firmly believe there are issues and we support the union that is PSRA. And going forward, we're going to have this concern where it, it might be VAR isn't gone to, it might be an offside call isn't isn't called, it might be cards handed out or not handed out as as they should have been. But there have been multiple games, St. Louis City's among them, Miami's have been named. There's a game against Nashville where the the head head official has just been out of control of the match. And there was there were clearly players who were taking over, taking control. I don't personally think this is sustainable and I think it's it will continue to garner steam. This isn't something that MLS can clamp down on and really say that this, this quality is exactly as it was before the strike. We, you know, we, ha we often criticize referees for what their decisions are, but to me, there's no question about the level has dropped off this year. And with that, let's go into one of our final notes, which I, honestly don't know how to, I don't really know how to go over this one other than just trying to explain what happened and letting it speak for itself. A few weeks ago, or a few days ago, maybe it's just been a long month. A few days ago, a reporter for FC Cincinnati, Laurel Failer, who works for Queen City Press, had her press credentials revoked by FC Cincinnati. At the time, it was very ambiguous on what really happened still kind of ambiguous, but at the time, Laurel just said that FC Cincinnati has revoked my credentials for two weeks. She said, I'm standing by my reporting and will continue covering the team from afar during this time, but wanted to be transparent as to why you won't see quotes in her coverage. This led to a firestorm on X, on social media, with hashtag free Laurel, with a lot of independent media being just absolutely appalled that a professional sports organization would revoke the credentials of somebody as respected as Laurel is because Laurel is one of the top independent journalists that cover MLS of any team. Her coverage is paid for a reason. Like she, she provides the quality that every team hopes to have in what their fans can get from their reporting. And so this went on since March 10th. So it's actually only been four days since I'm recording this quite horrifyingly short period of time. FC Cincinnati has since released a statement, as well as Laurel releasing a follow-up statement. And FC Cincinnati, on their website right now, says, in seven years, over thousands of stories, FC Cincinnati has never rescinded a reporter's credentials. They go on to say that reporters are invited, they're consistent with integrity, since their founding, they've supported local journalism. 
here's the, here's the kicker. They say, we had no intention of making this story public. However, since Laurel Failer has driven public attention to the matter, we have no choice but to provide answers to the many questions our fans are asking. Laurel has failed to act in accordance with the standards and practices of the Society of Professional Journalists and the MLS Notice of Credentials Use Conditions. She refuses to accept responsibility for her actions, despite multiple conversations and attempts at working together to forge a productive relationship between her and the club. Out of professional decorum, we will not be sharing the details publicly. Laurel did share a little bit publicly. She comes up, she follows up saying, I will not stand for bullying, but for now, this is my lone response to FC Cincinnati's statement of attack on me in response to others standing up for me. Quote, I strongly disagree with the statement that I violated any journalism ethics or MLS credential guidelines. Last week, when I asked for examples as to why I had lost credentials, I was told three situations where I spoke to sources outside of the facility or team approved interviews. I do not believe simply talking with sources within the team is how to cover a professional franchise. I believe the fans deserve more. There was a, an article that appeared in the Queen City Press shortly before this happened, and it was an interview that Laurel had with Gerard Nijkamp, former GM of FC Cincinnati. And I, I believe this was occurring after he was general manager, obviously, but it's, it's hard to find what examples they're exactly talking about in Laurel's statement of the three situations where she spoke to sources outside of the facility. Best of my knowledge, uh, this would have potentially included contacting some players, contacting staff, independently of the club, and going outside those bounds to initiate interviews. That seems to be what's implied by her statement. Um, the, the content of those interviews is anyone's guess, and there are, in fact, more questions left than answers with this. But... The firestorm of the free Laurel movement is far from over as, again, plenty of independent journalists, plenty of uh, blogs, podcasts, websites are jumping to her defense with this FC Cincinnati statement because it goes pretty far in regards to what they're saying about Laurel without giving the specific details. If you're, if you're telling the world that a journalist failed to act in accordance with the standards and practices of the Society of Professional Journalists and that they refuse to accept responsibility, but you won't share the details publicly, that's that's drawing a, a pretty harsh line. And that that's borderline of uh, some really legal implications there, in, in my opinion, my non-legal scholar opinion, of course. But th there's a lot going on here. And it tends to set a bad precedent if this is something that can occur throughout. I uh, obviously have no experience with what Laurel's talking about um, as far as this happening. Um, I am lucky enough and I am uh, privileged enough to be able to attend some of the press conferences that St. Louis City has. And so the, these conditions would apply to people like myself, people to the, the big 550 KTRS, uh, to 590, to 101, KMOV, KSDK, the list goes on. The other, uh, you know, Justin Horniker is of the same mind with talking soccer and everything he has going on. So there's there's a lot of things that we're privileged to that, thankfully, we haven't had this concern. I can only speak to my experiences with St. Louis City that it doesn't seem like there have been any issues with requesting access, with interview requests, with speaking to personnel. And so that's why I, I mentioned at the very beginning of this, I'm not quite sure like how to even respond to this other than saying I support Laurel and everything she's done so far. And I fail to believe best that I know from her reporting, from her journalism, from her interviews, from her style and from her professionalism that she would do anything to fail to act in accordance with the standards and practices of the Society of Professional Journalists. N refuting uh, an allegation is a far cry from failing or refusing to accept responsibility for supposed actions. I hope this is resolved quickly. I hope that there is some kind of amicable solution. And I definitely hope this isn't a uh, trendsetter that FC Cincinnati is driving with journalists. That said, um, <laughs> Bill Swaggins mentions in the chat, Cincinnati is kind of shady. They did some questionable things in the Miazga ref situation last year too. Um, and John Denning, oh, this, I believe Laurel wrote the juicy article about the Matt Miazga locker room event. The club didn't give any actual examples. That's the thing. And so all the, all the, all that we have to go off of is the fact that Laurel said 
The club told her three situations about speaking to sources outside of the facility or team approved interviews. Like I said, the best I can assume is she didn't go through the PR department of FC Cincinnati and, and went maybe to a direct person outside and kind of skirted what those MLS credential guidelines would say and team policies. That's as far as I am willing to venture a guess because of what her statement says in response to FC Cincinnati. Um, I hope Laurel gets back on, on the beat as far as being able to get quotes because her articles are, are top tier. That's all that I really have for Flyver Footy this week. I don't really mean to end things on a, a shady note or a, a, a harsh note like that, but I, I, I guess I'll go back to the game that we have to look forward to. If you've still stuck around this long and you're still interested in hearing me talk, um, God bless you. Thank you for doing that. I was so glad Edgar was able to join me because I think the, the insight he provided is going to be so fascinating. I mentioned some things I'm going to look at, X-Factors for St. Louis City. I'll quickly recap them here because that's fun to go off with. Let's say the midfield battle between Chris Durkin and Ricky Puj, that's going to be phenomenal to watch. I like the, the wing battles that we're going to see. We talked about the LA Galaxy fullbacks pushing high, leaving their center backs exposed. There's a lot that could happen with our attacking wingers and with our fullbacks in what they're able to do. Whether it's Nicholas Dewar or Anthony Marcanic on the left side, we know and we can assume that Thomas Totlin is going to be on the right side. And anytime Thomas Totlin has the ball or is on the field, you can assume good things are going to happen. And now he has his introduction to St. Louis as well. On Thursday, if anybody's local to St. Louis and is listening to this, you know we had multiple tornado warnings. Thomas Totlin provided possibly the single quote of the week where he was talking about he just didn't know how to handle that. He wasn't sure what was going on regarding the sirens going off and nothing being outside. You don't see rain. You don't see thunder, lightning. Well, you don't see thunder. You don't see lightning. Clearly no tornadoes in downtown St. Louis, but having the tornado siren go off, Thomas Otland coming from, coming from Scandinavia, coming to America, playing over landscapes in Europe. Now I feel he's a true Midwestern citizen. He's a true St. Louis and after experiencing multiple tornado warnings in a single day. So looking forward to his involvement on the wings, looking forward to seeing how our attack looks. Sam and Klaus could go on together, but if you have Sam and Klaus on the field at the same time, are you going to bring in Rasmus Alm for one of them in the second half? That's an option. Are you going to bring in Nukvi Thorson? That would be your next option up. You could also run um, an AZ Jackson if you're thinking about not starting him. He has been a second striker of sorts because the way that, that St. Louis has been listing their lineup lately has been kind of... As a 4-4-2, even though AZ Jackson has been listed as a second striker, in practicality, AZ Jackson is tucked underneath just like Klaus was with Sam early in the season. And it's more of a 4-2-3-1 with that number 10 false nine looking player underneath the striker. There's a lot of flexibility that this group has even without Eddie Leuven. It's not the flexibility that worries me. It's not the, the top talent that we can put on the field in place of Leuven. It's the... How are we going to progress the ball? How are we going to create a lot of those chances that Edu Leuven had been responsible for? Key passes, touches, those are critical things for how St. Louis has been able to find success early on in the season. And without Leuven, you're needing, if not a like-for-like -like replacement, you're going to need to shift where the ball moves on the field. And looking at the zone of control for St. Louis, I'm seeing some pretty significant wing action going on in the attacking third where we actually do control the ball greater than 50% of the time in the attacking thirds of both high-level wing areas, left and right side. So that's a place that St. Louis has been living at. Maybe they do a little more intentionality going back to the 2023 version of sorts with City, where you're not you're moving the ball a little bit more through the wings. You're looking up more than down on the on the on the ground for the ball. It's gonna be fascinating. That's that's gonna be interesting to watch. I'm I'm looking forward to speculating on our starting lineup. I gave my starting lineup earlier, but it's just mine. Phil, Santi, and I are going to have our collaborative or um, composite starting 11 that we've been putting out every Saturday. That's been fun to do because our, our DMs have been uh, feisty at times to see who wins out on some of their choices. I, I will admit to having won some battles and lost some battles, just like Santi and Phil have. So more, more to come on that on Saturday when we get to put that out. But thank you so much for sticking around. Um, Bilbo Swaggins, last go. Yeah, I think you do want lots of speed against those center backs. 35, 36 year old center backs. There's a lot that Salio can do with that. There's a lot that Klaus can do when he's pulling those center backs away, creating space. So be interesting to watch. I'm excited about this matchup. I, I ventured a 2 2 draw, but 
that MLS winning away is hard. I always default to that at the very least, if nothing else. But remember what happened last year when we went to LA. We started off with a 2 nothing lead. And it was only after Ricky Puj scored a penalty kick. It was only after Sam Adeneron had a red card and he left that things really started to come off the wheels. The wheels started to come off. And we had to make some significant subs late in that game. We've been playing well in LA. It was a good preseason at Coachella. It was a good game last year until it wasn't after some mitigating circumstances. Let's keep that trend going. And and let's get let's get a city win. Let's get three points. At the very least, let's get a draw and take a point away and continue that unbeaten streak because it's exciting to say St. Louis City's unbeaten as long as we can. Thank you so much for joining me. I am only Matt Baker here on Flyover Footy, and I appreciate you sticking with me. Uh, tune in to Flyover Fallout on Sunday with myself and Santi. We'll break down everything from that late, late, late LA Galaxy game. Hopefully you don't stay up late the entire night. Find some sleep. Wake up with us early on Sunday. And tell your friends. Flyover Footy is available everywhere you get your podcast. We'd love uh, to see if you subscribe, tune into the live cast. Leave us a review and a comment because we'd love to see those. It really helps us out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And I can't wait to be back here to talk more city. Talk to you later. Thank you.